Green Bay's Lambeau Field, the heroic memories have faded. Bart Starr's 1980 Packers sleepwalked through a preseason in which they scored only 17 points. Even the addition of the shotgun could not bring life to a listless Packer attack. Against the Chicago Bears, it was Green Bay's defense that made the difference. The NFC's worst a year ago at stopping the run, the Packers controlled Walter Payton, giving him but 65 yards in 31 carries. The teams traded field goals for four quarters, allowing Lynn Dickey the chance to come up with a big play in overtime. This 32-yard strike to James Lofton set the stage for what would be the week's most unusual play. Chester Markle wound up with the ball on his own blocked field goal and scored to give Green Bay a 12-6 victory. After a winless exhibition season, the Packers had defeated not only a division rival, but a team picked by many to go to the Super Bowl. The Bengals are probably green with envy over the play of the Detroit Lions. In Milwaukee, Packers linebacker Mike Douglas, number 53, thought he had devised a way to stop Billy Sims, number 20. Soon, however, Douglas and the Packers were forced to go back to the old drawing board, as the rookie totaled over 100 yards rushing for the second straight week. The simply sensational Mr. Sims sparked a 29-7 win. And Detroit, 2-14 in 1979, is 2-0 in 1980. The message is loud and clear. The Lions are patsies no longer. Learning a lesson is not quite the phrase when describing what the Rams did to Green Bay, or perhaps better stated, what the Packers did to themselves last week. In the second quarter alone, Los Angeles scored 37 points, their highest 15-minute total in 30 years, largely due to five interceptions, all converted to touchdowns. Rookie Johnny Johnson raced 99 yards, the longest return of an interception in Rams history. Then shortly thereafter, veteran Rod Perry duplicated the feat, this time from merely 83 yards away. Los Angeles' scoring orgy was not totally the result of Packer pratfalls. Luck, too, aided in their nearly shorting out the Anaheim Stadium scoreboard. Underneath it all was the simple fact that the Rams were clearly the superior team. The Packers were manhandled by the champions of the NFC as number 32, Cullen Bryant, blew away the last obstacle for backfield mate Elvis Peacock. The Rams executed well, and Green Bay, well, they were executed, 51 to 21. In Green Bay, Cowboy quarterback punter Danny White pulled out a few surprises of his own against the Packers. White completely baffled the pack on a 48-yard run from punt formation. Looking more impressive with each passing week, number 11 did an impeccable job of reading Packer blitzes. 
The results were worth easy touchdowns and an easy 28-7 Cowboy victory. Two former Packer greats were reunited in Green Bay, but Bart Starr's beleaguered pack outplayed Forrest Gregg's inconsistent Bengals to win for the first time since opening day, 14-9. Packer quarterback Lynn Dickey passed for over 200 yards and two touchdowns. As Green Bay backed up a vote of confidence their coach received from the team's board of directors earlier in the day. while two other divisional rivals, the Packers and Bucks, were battling each other in Tampa. Once again, scores would be few and painfully achieved in yet another defensive battle. Cordell Middleton's touchdown was one of only two surrendered by the Bucks, despite an incredible 418-yard passing day by Packer quarterback Lynn Dickey. But once more, Tampa's vaunted defense made tight end Paul Kaufman, number 82, paid dearly for the score. Dickey completed 35 on the day, while Buccaneer Doug Williams only completed six. But like so many times before, it was the Buck defense that kept them in the game. Linebacker Richard Wood raised 55 yards with Dickey's only mistake. And after a Williams keeper, the game was deadlocked at 14 after regulation. Last week, the offense set the tone around the league, and this week it was the defense that determined winner and loser. In this game, there would be neither, as kicker Tom Burney, who replaced recently cut Chester Marco, failed twice to bring victory for the pack. Like a true professional, however, Mr. Burney remained completely unaffected by it all, eagerly anticipating 10 more weeks of this marvelous character builder known as professional football. Since witch burning is against the law, the Cleveland populace took solace from the fact that the visiting Packers tend to decompose faster than burning tissue paper. But in this contest, the pack got off to a blazing start. Lynn Dickey threw for nearly 400 yards and his touchdown pass to James Lofton, number 80, demonstrated that Green Bay was fired up. The Browns, who trail going into the fourth quarter, seem bewitched by mysterious forces. But with 16 seconds left in the game, an underthrown Brian Sight pass to Dave Logan, number 85, remained firmly in the receiver's hand. The 26-21 win was Cleveland's fourth in their last five games. And another look at the 46-yard touchdown pass shows that the victory resulted from Sipe withstanding a furious Green Bay blitz, then unloading off balance just in the nick of time. Sipe clearly possesses all the conventional skills for beating an opponent. But weird bounces, upsets, and near upsets made last Sunday an unconventional day in the NFL. And Brian Sipe's magic formula for staving off the witching hour remains his little secret. Another team on the move is the Green Bay Packers. Expected to be the NFC's doormat, the Pack has won three games and came within 16 seconds of a victory over the Cleveland Browns. Against the Vikings, Green Bay's offense continued to be surprisingly effective. Eddie Lee Ivory, number 40, supplied the running punch, 
while Lynn Dickey threw a touchdown pass for the fourth straight game. Dickey's toss to reserve tight end Bill Larson were the only points the Packers needed to defeat Minnesota 16 to 3. Green Bay has quietly entered the playoff chase in the NFC Central, the only division in football with but one team over 500. The return of Terry Bradshaw to the Pittsburgh lineup spelled a turnaround for the Steelers' losing streak. Yet there remained a rough edge on this disjointed Steeler team, evident in a distinct lack of timing. The suddenly opportunistic Green Bay Packers hardly resembled the Packers of a month ago. Indeed, they are not, particularly with the recent addition of a rookie fullback from Missouri, Jerry Ellis, number 31. Ellis' 69-yard touchdown reception was one of two he received from Lynn Dickey to put the pack ahead by five in the fourth quarter. But the brilliance of the rookie Ellis was negated by Packer mistakes. A safety on a misguided snap from center became the difference in a two-point Packer loss as the Pittsburgh tandem of Bradshaw and Lynn Swan were reunited to end the Steeler three-game losing streak 22-20. That cellar nearly became the Packers' home last week. Number 88, Freddie Salomon, gave San Francisco a 13 to nothing jump. But the 49ers' explosive offense soon blew up in their faces. When number 22, Mark Lee, stripped the ball from Earl Cooper, number 49, the Packers hardly looked like the losers that everyone had tabbed them to be and the second consecutive week of fine running by rookie Jerry Ellis, number 31, helped make them 23 to 16 winners. Maybe the pack has drawn inspiration from Tampa Bay, who proved last season that it's possible to go from worst to first. Before the start of the 1980 season, the Green Bay Packers were thought of as the most woeful lot in the entire NFL. And to have predicted the pack as contenders for the NFC Central would have been laughable. This year, Green Bay has proven that they are no joke. The once sluggish Packer offense is now a well-balanced attack, anchored by the achievements of quarterback Lynn Dickey, who has been throwing touchdowns with precision. Like his team, Dickey had been written off by many, but has surprised everyone with his remarkable ability to find gifted receivers like number 80, James Lofton. Dickey has averaged nearly 300 yards passing over the last six games and has prodded the Packer defense to provide the big play. Here, Ezra Johnson, number 90, used a quick outside move to defeat his blocker and blindside giant quarterback Phil Simms. Like Green Bay, the Giants' inability to move the ball had written them off into oblivion. But the recent luster by New York's quarterbacking has brought back the polish to the Big Apple. On their very first play from scrimmage, Sims connected with number 83, Ernest Gray, for a 50-yard touchdown. Packer head coach Bart Starr grimly realized that an early hot hand by Sims might melt the confidence of his suspect secondary, and that is exactly what happened. Sims passed for 332 yards and tossed three touchdown passes to Gray as the Giants upended the Packers 27-21 for their second consecutive win. By 
past Sunday, the Minnesota Vikings had a monkey on their backs, the Green Bay Packers. Lynn Dickey, often injured in the past, but now fully healthy, is putting the hurt on the rest of the league. Dickey was 13 of 21 for 218 yards and was abetted by James Lofton, one of the NFL's best receivers. The Packers' running game was healthy, too. Eddie Lee Ivory, number 40, rushed for 145 yards, including this 38-yard touchdown. Ivory's running mate, free agent rookie Jerry Ellis, also topped the 100-yard mark. The Ivory Ellis tandem helped open up the passing game, and Dickey exploited the run-conscious Vikings with a 35-yard touchdown pass to Andra Thompson. Preseason pollsters had consigned the Packers to the loading dock, but the 25-13 victory left them very much in the NFC Central race. For the Chicago Bears, the word for the day was offense. And then, more offense. With two chances for a playoff berth, slim and none, Chicago aired it out. Vince Evans threw for 316 yards and three touchdowns against Green Bay, as the Bears' passing game, ranked last in the NFC, emerged from a season of hibernation. Evans' howitzer was only a part of Chicago's arsenal. The man they call Sweetness added a few steps of his own. Walter Payton's 130 yards moved him into sixth place on the all-time NFL rushing list. What's even more remarkable is that Payton is only in his sixth season. When the day had ended, Peyton and the Bears had been eliminated from the NFC Central playoff chase, but not before Chicago had made its final stand. If all the world is a stage, then Lambeau Field seemed to be a frostbitten road show for the Houston Oilers. Away from the temperature-controlled environs of the Astrodome, the Oilers' trip to Green Bay's Nordic climbs made their normally solid defense at first appear brittle. Big plays from people like number 31 Jerry Ellis seem to set the stage for a Packer upset, but it was a script which the Oilers refused to accept. Houston effectively immobilized the Packers' offense, and Green Bay's defense tried the same by utilizing a 10-man defensive front, gambling that such a formation would stymie the Oilers' potent ground game. Rob Carpenter, number 26, proved that this type of kamikaze defense can be suicidal. Carpenter was excellent in a supporting role, but Earl Campbell starred. At times, number 34's 181-yard performance seemed effortless. After facing playoff elimination two weeks ago, Houston's 22-3 win propelled the Oilers into a first-place tie in the AFC Central, a scenario that has not left a dry eye in the Packer house. While Green Bay's losing melodrama turned off the Packer faithful, the Detroit Lions, who led their division throughout most of the season, were another team unable to hide from the embarrassment of not making the playoffs. But against the Packers, it was Bubba Baker, number 60, who forced Lynn Dickey to look for a place to hide. 
Baker trapped Dickey three times, giving the Lion defensive end a total of 17 sacks for the season. Inspired by his play, Baker's teammates decapitated the Packer offense. While the Lion defense stymied the Green Bay attack, quarterback Gary Danielson used his one-man attack to generate Detroit's offense. Billy Sims' reception set up his own one-yard touchdown run as number 20 proved once again that he is responsible for putting the bite back into the Detroit Lions. But for Detroit to win, they cannot rely solely on Sims. Gary Danielson must match his early season performance more often. Against Green Bay, he did, and Detroit won easily 24-3. The Lions finished second behind Minnesota in the NFC Central Division, but their disappointment was eased somewhat by the fact that 1980 was Detroit's first winning season in eight years. <laughs>